Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, at an event sponsored by the Institute for Palestine Studies, um, which features the work uh, published uh, in the Journal of Palestine Studies over a period of 50 years, and in particular, uh, articles written by our four presenters, who I will present in a minute, um, in which each of them picked out uh, a couple of articles uh, that they thought were either superb articles that received the attention they deserved or ones that had not received the attention they deserve. And each of them, each of the four, uh, will be speaking about the articles that they, that they chose um, over this 50 year period during which the Journal of Palestine Studies has been published. Um, let me say one word about the journal uh, before I introduce our four uh, presenters. Um, the Journal of Palestine Studies, as, as I just mentioned, has been published for 50 years. It has an archive of articles, which is accessible to those who have access to JSTOR or through the Taylor and Francis website or through the Institute for Palestine Studies website, which includes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. Um, these are being accessed at a remarkable rate uh, by uh, interested researchers. Uh, in 2019, 220,000 articles were downloaded. In 2020, 330 articles were downloaded. So people are reading um, this wonderful archive, uh, back, 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 the back archive, in other words, of the journal, uh, and are obviously finding it useful uh, to their research, uh, to whatever it is they do. Let me introduce the four presenters uh, in the order in which they will be presenting. Um, and then I'll hand it over to the first of them. Um, the first presenter is Selim Tamari. He's a senior fellow of the IPS. He was the former director of the uh, IPS's Institute of Jerusalem Studies. Uh, he's co-editor of Jerusalem Quarterly and Hawliyat al -Quds. He's an emeritus professor of sociology at Birzeit, and he is a extremely prolific and highly respected author. I won't mention his works. Um, the second uh, presenter is Leila Farsakh, who is the chair of the political science department at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where she's also an associate professor. Uh, she works on the political economy of uh, Palestine and alternatives to partition. She has a number of books, including Palestinian Labor Migration, which was published in 2005, The Arab and Jewish Questions. I'm not going to give you the subtitles, which was co-edited with Bashir Bashir. And her book that's about to come out very soon, I think, Rethinking Statehood in Palestine, Self-Determination and Decolonization Beyond Partition. Um, the third of our four presenters is Alex Winder. Alex is a visiting assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies at the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. His book, Between Jaffa, his first book, Between Jaffa and Mount Hebron, um, was published in Arabic by the Institute for Palestine Studies in 2016. He has published widely in the Journal of Palestine Studies, Radical History Review, and other venues. Uh, he has served as executive director of our Jerusalem Quarterly, and in January of next year, begins to serve as the co-editor uh, of Jerusalem Quarterly. Uh, finally, and last but certainly not least, is Srimati Mitter. Uh, she is the Kutaiba el Ghanim Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern History and International and Public Affairs at Brown University. She's published a great deal, including uh, articles in the journal and elsewhere, uh, and she, as I said, will be the fourth of our presenters. Let me now um, hand over to Salim. Uh, I'm just looking where on my screen Salim is. Uh, Salim is joining us from Ramallah, and uh, we'll be talking about his article. And um, let me hand it over to you, Salim. Tada. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you for inviting me to this wonderful session. Um, I have chosen the subject of Ottoman studies, uh, which uh, is not extremely extensive in the journal, but has a very rich number of contributions uh, from which was very difficult to actually choose the gems. But I did uh, finally decide to focus on two essays, uh, one by Pshara Dumani and Pshara's work on the political economy of Jabal Nabis is extremely well known, but uh, especially because of the um, positionality of that essay in make us, making us rethink Ottoman history, 
not only Palestine, but also throughout the Middle East. And the second essay by Louis or Louis Fishman uh, deals with the incident uh, of uh, protests on um, Haram Sharif arena and in 1911 and its role in awakening a local Palestinian identity and the challenging uh, the hegemony or the ability of the high port in determining uh, the policies of archaeology and archaeological excavations uh, and the importance of these excavations in defining and redefining Palestinian and Arab and Muslim identity. So with the same, uh, with the first essay, uh, this is the formative essay from which the uh, Domani's work on the political economy of Jabal Nablus emerged. And in it, we see an, an incipient genius at work in using uh, local records, both Sharia court records and logs which belong to uh, landlords and merchants from Nablus, which uh, Chara was, uh, had systematic uh, uh, excavation in digging these records and incorporating them with the Sharia court records in a rereading of the political economy of the highlands but also of Ottoman Palestine. And I want to refer to what I consider five uh, manners in which this essay and the subsequent work on the political economy of Jabal Nablus made us rethink uh, Ottoman history of Palestine and Syria. The first one is that he challenged the traditional paradigm of modernity, which is quite often uh, take us back to either the Napoleonic uh, expeditions in Egypt or the uh, campaign of Brahim Pasha, Muhammad Ali in 1831 in the conquest of Syria and the separation of Syria from the Ottoman domain for 10 years, 10 crucial years, which many people saw as the beginning of rupture between the historical formations uh, which the Ottomans established in the Middle East and modernity. So in, in this sense, Pshara says that the, um, the, there is a different temperament of social change, which does not necessarily go back to this period. That is, he does not see the rupture as coming up from the early 19th century, uh, late 18th century, but a, a dynamic which existed before and continued after that period. And he did this by shifting the focus of the study from modernity as something which dealt with the literal uh, mercantile urban formations in Syria and its relationship to um, the Mediterranean trade of France and Britain and Austria to one in which the internal dynamic of the central highlands were crucial understanding social change. So the shift occurred between the uh, literal uh, mercantile urban culture to an internal dynamic focused on the central highlands, especially the role of the neglected city of Nablus in its internal trade with, uh, with Anatolia, with uh, Damascus, with Egypt, but also with the Mediterranean uh, uh, capital through the political economy of oil and cotton and textiles. The second thing he did was to focus rather than on the history of elites to one based on the study of merchants, craftsmen, and peasants, especially the relationship between uh, local landlords and peasants. And this was part, of course, of a longer trend which began with subaltern studies and in France with the Annal School, uh, going back 
50 or 80 years earlier, but one which uh, Pshara was able, able to articulate through his reading of the records for Palestine and Syria. I say Palestine and Syria because his later work focused on the relationship between uh, Lebanese Syrian towns like Homs, uh, Tripoli, and Jabal Nablus. Uh, the other thing uh, Pshara made us rethink for this was his uh, shift from the nature of the Ottoman state and the idea of the state as an exploiter of the peasantry. In his reading of local records, we find that there's an internal dynamic between two things. First was the, the way in which a decentralized Ottoman state gave substantial autonomy uh, to local elites, to local forces in the administration of the agrarian system. And second, a very interesting examination of compacts and contracts, some oral, some written, between landlords, landlords and peasants, and the mediation of merchant capital in this. So we re, he redefined the idea of exploitation as one first that gave extreme latitude to the local elites in the running of the agrarian system and the extraction of the surplus from that local elites to the state through the Iltizam system. But also, and this is more important, more original with Pshara's uh, work, is the way in which local compacts, as he calls them, or contracts, uh, went through the Iltizam system to define a very dynamic relationship between peasants and landlords. Uh, and one in which took into event uh, famines, the agricultural cycle, the, uh, the tempo of the production of local crops, and the ascendancy of local peasants into ownership of land in what seemingly lo looked like a sharecropping system. And the uh, last point is that he redefined the nature of the state as one moving from uh, through the Tanzimat reform uh, from an extremely decentralized system to one of excessive centralization, which began with the Ottoman land law of 1858 and later with the coming into power uh, after the, uh, the constitutional revolution of 1908 of a centralized state, which began to uh, de-link the relationship between peasants and landlords in favor of merchant capital, of land becoming commoditized, and how this commoditization of land led to a new system of relationship between uh, peasants and landlords. Uh, that story uh, is carried off uh, in the second uh, major work of Shara on Tripoli and Nablus, and the household economy, which does not, is not covered here. But these five patterns of analysis highlight the importance of Dumani's work and uh, our uh, rethinking of the Ottoman system. Uh, do I have time to deal with the second essay or is this enough? Actually, Salim, you, you've, uh, you've gone for about 10 minutes, so maybe in answer to questions later on you can take up the second essay um because we we thought that each person should speak for five to eight minutes um do you want to say a few words about the second essay perhaps and then leave uh, other things about it to to later on in q a perhaps so say, well, maybe yeah. maybe just say a little bit about the fishman yeah, essay, we, why we, it's important yeah louis fishman's essay is on the incident of protest which happened 1911 uh, within the Ottoman parliament and in Jerusalem over the excavation of the Haram area looking for um, uh, archaeological remains and that was a spark of uh, local uh, potentates especially um, urban elites 
against the Ottoman administration uh, giving uh, the right of excavation and in Louis Fishman's analysis leading to a awakening or reawakening of Palestinian national identity through protest against uh, archaeological excavations. Fantastic. Um, thanks, uh, Salim. That's an article that actually has enormous resonance for the present day. Um, Naida, would you like to go ahead? You are your second speaker in our in our panel. Please, Fabani. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, first of all for the journal for organizing this excellent idea of having hidden gems and greatest hits in various uh, discipline and themes, because I think it allowed us as researchers to go back to some of to trace the evolution of knowledge production in the Journal of Palestine Studies and see how amazing it is. And as very beautifully Salim demonstrated, how many articles were first published in the Journal of Palestine Studies before they became the seminal work, whether it is of Shara Dumani, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sarah Roy uh, and others. So I think that's a very beautiful way to see uh, the, the scope and, and the, the, the width of the publications done by the Journal of Palestine Studies that sometimes we, we forget because for me, the value of the journal it is as much its rigor in academic uh, research as it is in topicality and being present with the policy concerns of the day. And I think that if anybody who wants to do research on, on the journal will see how this evolved over the time and how the essence of the political and the economic has always remained there. So I'm actually very nice, that, very, very happy that Salim talked about the article because it's a very beautiful segue to what I'm going to talk about in the articles we have in the journal about uh, the political economy of Palestine and the Palestinians. But I have to say, for me, it was a little bit hard to decide which are the hidden gems and the, the best hits, because there's a lot of them and very valuable of them. And, and I try to th thematize it into these two themes. We talk, people like to talk about the political economy of Palestine, but sometimes they don't know what, what do we mean by Palestine? Do we mean the Palestine of 1948? Do we need the, the Palestine of the Ottomans? The Palestine of the Ottoman was much clearer. The Palestine post 48 becomes much more complicated. And there we have, I wouldn't call it tension, but uh, I have, I think Jojono does very well in talking about the political economy of the Palestinians and trying to talk about what are the structural changes that happened to the Palestinian economy since 1948. And in that regard, I'd like to highlight two things in particular, or maybe three articles. Um, the first uh, is the article by uh, Yusuf Asayah in 1986, which is called The Political Economy Under Occupation, uh, Palestinian Economy Under Occupation. And I like it very much, and I think it's very important. And, and now people forget it, but I think it's very neat because it talks about it tries to attempt to say what happened to the Palestinian. It builds on the work of Rosemary Sayer, Salim, uh, Elias Zere, uh, who were talking about the politi political economy of the Palestinians. What structural transformation happened to the Palestinian after the Nakba? And they were talking about how they transformed from being landlords or landless into mostly people, you know, peasants into uh, wage labor, whether it is wage labor inside Israel, whether it is wage labor in, ref in Lebanon and Syria as they became refugees, or wage laborer to Israel after 1967, uh, as they migrate, I mean, day laborer. And the article of, of Sayer is very beautiful because he calls what happened to the Palestinian economy then is the popularization of the Palestinian. He used a term which is Marxist, I would we call it a, a term which is political economy, focusing on the intersection between economics and politics rather than reify economics as something which is not related to the political and also situated in a settler colonial context without calling it settler colonialism as such. And this article is important because I think it provides one of the bases, one of the foundation for Sarah Roy's uh, seminal work on the uh, political economy of de-development. Sarah Roy, of course, is credited for coming with the terms of de-development that basically what the Palestinians have witnessed since 67 in particular is not the prospect to create a viable economy that can become the basis of a Palestinian state. Rather, what happened is a process of de-development. See, it is the, the basis of this argument in an article published in 1987, long before her book, her seminal book in 1995, The Gaza Strip, The Political Economy of Dedevelopment. She talks about it in 87 and again, in, in, uh, and I like it in particular for two reasons. One, because it focuses, brings the focus on Gaza, which is often forgotten. And Gaza 
she shows how Gasha remains and has always been the linchpin of the Palestinian condition in a certain way, uh, like a microcosm picture of what's happening. Uh, and and as also as a laboratory, which Darrell Rill Ali in one of his articles in the journal also talks about that, how Gaza becomes a laboratory. But in Sarah Roy's argument, shows how does the process of operization happen? What are its dynamic political and economic forces? And explains nicely that it's, it's tied to the Israeli occupation. Of course, it's tied to a settler colonial project determined to do two things, possess Palestinians from their land, turn them into wage labor, what other people already said, but also prevent any possibility for sustainable internally articulated development in the Palestinian territories. And this is a process that continues with us also after Oslo, despite the big promise of Oslo or the hope that people had in the 1990s with the peace process, that the Palestinian economy is the West Bank and Gaza. It can create the core of a viable Palestinian state. It is possible to remove the, the hackle of Israeli colonialism by having some autonomy that can become sovereignty. And actually what we see instead, what happens is a restructuring of Palestinian, of, of uh, Israeli colonial dynamic, rather than the possibility for the Palestinian to have viable development. And I think in that respect, one article is particularly very famous and I think very important is by um, Khalidi and, and uh, Subhi Samur, uh, neoliberalism as, uh, as liberation. Uh, I think this is a, a very important article because it brings back a political economy analysis into the Palestinian economy and it emphasizes how the political and the economic are not separated. So it gives us a, a, a critique of neoliberalism. It gives us a critique of neoliberalism, how it works in Palestine and shows how important and dangerous it is when a, a neoliberalism seeks to depoliticize the economic process and to, to take politics out of the equation. So Palestinians become concerned about how they can meet their earning daily needs or live a good life and, and, and trade liberation for a better life, which of course never happens. And the best way, again, the best article that explain how it never happens, how the occupation, the structure of structural colonialism uh, intensifies and deepens, takes new forms, but cannot be eradicated by ad hoc policy or by foreign aid. It needs some a, a, a real strategy of economic and political liberation. I think uh, the article of Helga uh, Tawil Suri, which is a hidden gem, uh, people don't know about it. It was in 2011 or 12, I can't remember, um, in which she talks about uh, the Palestinian economy, that, about the digital economy, because there has been so much hope that the digital economy is what's going to save Palestine, what's going to save the Palestinian especially now with the COVID crisis and the COVID pandemic, everybody, the focus on the internet, the focus on the digital era is what is seen as the only way how we can get and re rethink the economy worldwide as well as in Palestine. And what is so valuable about Helga's article, uh, Helga Tawil, is digital occupation, Gaza's high tech enclosure, she entitles it, it's a very beautiful title is to show how the digital economy already since 19, 2012 was an attempt to, for Israel to privatize the surveillance and the, the, the settler do, uh, colonial domination of, the, uh, of, of Gaza, which indeed has been transmitted uh, to the West Bank. So I'll stop at the, here because I think this, this provides a good overview. And again, thank you very much for this excellent opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Leila. Uh, especially for the plug of my brother's article. Um, <laughs> Alex, um, you're up next, please. Alex Winter. Pause on, thank, please. Thank you, Rashid. Um, and thanks also to uh, the co my co-panelists. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to, um, to sit virtually with you and, and discuss um, the works of, of the Journal of Palestine Studies. Um, and of course, it's normal to thank uh, the organizers of an event, but I do want to emphasize my really tremendous gratitude to the Journal of Palestine and the Institute for Palestine Studies, um, which have had a, a kind of not only a, a significant impact on the field and fields that, that deal with uh, Palestine uh, academically and, and, and kind of the policy world around Palestine, but also kind of personally on my own uh, individual trajectory, I kind of my 
relationship with JPS goes back to 2004 uh, when I joined its Washington office as an editorial assistant. And um, so it's somewhat strange to think of that as that relationship is spanning about a third of the, the journal's kind of life to date and, and almost half of my own um, really kind of uh, uh, kind of pushed me in the direction. And it's great to see so many um, friends and and um, and family on, in the uh, um, people who are joining us for this event as well, and including um, editors uh, of, of the journal, Maya Tabitz and, and Linda Butler. I saw both of them. So um, I think we they are do special thanks as well for, for kind of so much of the, the uh, what is excellent work that comes out in the journal. All right, so enough of my kind of own personal history and on to history with a, a capital H, as they say. Um, uh, as the late Haitian anthropologist uh, Michel Rolf Triot wrote in his book, Silencing the Past, the word history carries two meanings, right? both what happened and that which is said to have happened, events and the narration uh, of those events. And JPS has over the past half century, I think, contributed significantly to our understanding of Palestinian history in both senses, right? documenting and analyzing Palestinian experiences of socio-historical processes, but also illuminating the narrative framing of these experiences as well. So, you know, when asked to select a hidden gem and a greatest hit from JPS's catalog with the somewhat overwhelming uh, theme of history, um, I did want to select uh, uh, kind of articles that highlighted both dimensions of Palestinian history. For the hidden gem that, that I wrote about, um, uh, the hidden gem that I wrote about was Charles Anderson's 2017 article, State Formation from Below and the Great Revolt in Palestine, uh, which is that first kind of history, the, the kind of what happened uh, kind of history. And the subject of Anderson's article, of course, is the 1936 to 39 Palestinian uprising against British colonial rule and the Zionist project that it supported. And this revolt uh, really was one of the most significant events uh, in modern Palestinian history. But historians really have kind of focused primarily on either the, the British kind of joint British Zionist counterinsurgency that, that quashed the revolt or the impact of that suppression on Palestinian society and politics in the 1940s, ultimately paving the way to the catastrophe of 1948. In his article, though, Anderson emphasizes the kind of internal structures that sustained the Palestinians uprising against you know, the greatest power uh, in the world at that time, the British Empire, right? And these internal structures included a, a kind of decentralized network of national committees that organized and enforced the 1936 general strike that inaugurated uh, the revolt, and also the system of rebel courts that disciplined and, and offered justice to Palestinian uh, communities in subsequent years during the revolt itself. And in these institutions, Anderson sees a kind of vision for the decolonized state for which Palestinians were fighting during the revolt, right? The kind of their vision of a liberated Palestine. And to get at this vision, uh, he really kind of draws significantly on the contemporary, but also uh, post hoc analysis of the Great Revolt by its Palestinian participants, right? People like uh, Bashat Abu Qarbiya, Mohammed Azad Darwaza, Isa Sifri, uh, Akram Zaitar, people like this. And, and I think what's important is it wasn't in this article and, and in Charles uh, Anderson's work more generally, just a matter of kind of mining these sources um, for, for data, but really for emphasizing Palestinians' own narration of what happened, right? That is taking seriously Palestinian history in both meanings of the word. And this brings me to the, the greatest hit that I wrote about, um, uh, Tarif Khaledi's 1981 article, Palestinian Historiography, 1900 to 1948. Um, a very uh, kind of self-explanatory title. Um, but in this article, uh, Khalidi really rejects the notion that the first half of the 20th century was a period of Arab cultural barrenness, right? Kind of coming after the, the 19th, late 19th century Nahda. Um, instead, uh, he looks at how Palestinian intellectuals flock to what he calls uh, declamatory professions, right? Law, education, journalism. And this reflected kind of broader regional transformations uh, of socio-cultural networks and institutions, right? New opportunities for education, employment, a kind of rising uh, growth of certain kinds of professional classes. But it also reflected the, the impulse among Palestinians to address the pressing political questions of the time, including Zionist colonization. 
And in this atmosphere, uh, for, for Palestinians, history became uh, what Khadi calls something of a national pastime. And I think we can say that this continues to be the case, right? Uh, the article really provides a kind of annotated bibliography of, of kind of important figures, works uh, uh, by people like Ruhi al Khaldi, Tawfiq Kanan, uh, Ihsan al Nimr, Bandali al Josi, the above mentioned uh, Isa Sifri that, that Charles Anderson used, and many, many others, right? We see the real kind of fluorescence of uh, uh, kind of knowledge production among Palestinians uh, in this period. And so Khaledi helps map a kind of universe of indigenous knowledge production taking place in Palestine from 1900 to 1948. And I use the term indigenous knowledge production here, not just because the, the article, uh, the, the authors of these works were the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine, Palestinians, um, but because although their work was often concerned with the Zionist uh, settler colonial project, the motivations and, and, and visions were much larger than that and, and really exceeding the colonial frame, right? And in, in fact, kind of we can see how scholars in Palestinian studies, in, including um, members of this panel, Bashar Dumani, who was already mentioned, continue to return to these works, right, produced by Palestinians uh, in, in the first half of the 20th century, not only as, as records of the past, um, but as ways of trying to think about kind of Palestinian ways of, of seeing the world, Palestinian ways of, of knowing, and really generating new approaches to and interpretations of the past. Again, not just kind of seeking to, to, to mine the data that's found in these histories. Ultimately, I think um, both of these articles affirm Palestinian struggles to assert control over uh, their own histories, whether these are kind of struggles taking place physically in, in villages and cities of Palestine, or struggles that are taking place discursively in books, uh, periodicals, lectures, conferences like this one. Uh, in their resistance to settler colonialism's eliminationist drive, uh, these struggles are in a sense reactive, but they're also much more than this, they're, they're proactive, right? They call forth the past, the present, a future, the center Palestinians connections to each other, uh, to the land of Palestine, to the broader region in which Palestine is situated. And this is a struggle, I think, broadly speaking, uh, in which the Journal of, Palest uh, Journal of Palestine Studies itself has been engaged for the past half century. And it's the struggle that it, and I think, you know, we carry on moving forward. Uh, and I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Alex, uh, for that uplifting ending. Um, Srimadi, you're up. Please, Fadani. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Maya. All the, I'll just echo Alex's words. Um, it is really, um, like Alex, you know, for me, this is almost like paying homage to the journal that was the first academic, um, really the first academic institution I encountered long before I decided to become a student of Palestinian history, it was the journal that I started reading. And this is something I really wanted to honor in my choice of the two pieces. So I think the journal really has this academic side, which really you know, publishes what I think and what I think we all think is cutting edge scholarship on Palestine. But it's also from the beginning always had this very accessible public facing side as well. And the two articles I've picked uh, are in some ways reflect sort of my own journey into Palestine studies through this journal. So one is a very scholarly work by Alexander Shosh, and the other one is a very journalistic piece by Peter Lagerquist. And I think they both, well, I'll explain why I picked them both as well for my bit, which is on capitalism. But I think they both also really explain what this journal does so well and what makes it different from other academic journals, that it has those two elements, the journalistic, very accessible, you don't need to have read a lot to understand that piece, and also this really incredibly innovative work of academic scholarship, and that's what those two pieces do. And uh, I just want to reiterate that the journal, that archive, you know, when, uh, when I think it was Maya who sent it to us, it was, it was overwhelming, but it was also just incredible just to look at it and, and, and just realize how much knowledge and activism has been produced by in these pages over the years. 
And so what I did initially was, well, initially I was just like, okay, I can't come up with two, no way, you know? And then and clearly I cheated. If you read my article, I cheated because I, I sneaked in quite a few other things, not just two. And that, that was, you know, my initial reaction. And then the second thing was really, you know, this problem that I had, and I went back and forth a lot with Shireen and with Maya on this, which is what is capitalism? And what is the difference between that and political economy, which I knew that Leila was, you know, already writing about. So my initial, you know, instinct was very much, uh, you know, to actually pick the pieces that Leila picked. And, and in fact, I picked Leila's piece because that was one of the most formative things I've read. And actually I picked Salim's piece um, on, uh, Salim has forgotten that side, or he's turned his back on that side of him, but he used to be a labor historian. And that article, Building People's Homes, it really is, I don't want to embarrass you, Salim, but it is, it, it really teaches, I think, us how, you know, labor is both those pieces, both of you. Um, so that was my instinct, and that's why I cheated and sneaked them into my, my list. So I was going, and then I thought, okay, but that is labor, and that's not really the kind of capitalism that I want to write about. And also, I wanted to separate myself from the political economy piece. So I went back to this, this sort of definitional issue of what do I want to think about as capitalism? And I thought the articles I picked should have some element of the market in them. Um, and I think that is essentially, what, at least what market capitalism can be defined as being different from just a general analysis of labor and political economy. So I wanted the market and I wanted consumption patterns to be reflected in the two articles I picked. And that's why I picked these two. The other thing very much like uh, Salim and Alex and like all of us, we're all historians. So I think the other thing that I found in looking at this incredibly rich archive is that really all the works that were dealing with the economy broadly speaking, most of them dealt with post 67 Palestine. And I really did want to have at least one piece that went back not to the, and there were a few on mandate era. The reason I picked Alexander Schultz's speech is firstly because it is a really, really interesting and I think good piece, though it's very difficult to read. It's a bit dull, uh, which is why I balanced it with the other one, which is really wonderful to read. But I think it is a piece that people have to read uh, as a greatest hit if they want to understand the, the impact of capitalism on the Palestinian economy before European colonialism or before formal colonialism. And so the Shosh piece, um, I've chosen it for, and yeah, I really want to say that both the pieces I chose, and I struggled a bit with that, both of them happen to be written by white European men. And one of the things that the journal does, I think one of the many things the journal does very well is really highlight work by Palestinian, Palestinian scholars. And then I was like, okay, so I'm choosing two pieces written by two German or German sounding people. And, and um, I, I don't want anyone to think, oh, I wasn't aware of, of what that is signaling. And yet these are the reasons why, I think partly that's the reason why I had that long preamble where I went through all the other pieces that I would have picked otherwise, or that I might have picked, or that I thought of picking. But I settled with the Schultz and the Lago Quest because both of them highlight the role of market capitalism in the history of Palestine. And both of them highlight very interestingly the role of European or foreign consumption patterns in, in, in the trajectory of capitalism in Palestine. The Schultz piece, very briefly, it, it goes, it's, it goes from 1860s to the 1880s, and it shows how ramping up demand in Europe for citrus products and other agricultural goods that happen to be grown in Palestine really transformed the Palestinian economy. And it's a really interesting piece because for one, it counters the narrative of Palestine being some sort of economic backwater before Zionist intervention, that you know, this whole, the desert, you know, that it was a desert and then the Zionists made it bloom. What Alexander Scholz actually shows is that the Palestinian provinces of the Ottoman Empire in this period were trading so much with Europe that they actually prevented the Syrian provinces from running deficits in the same period. Otherwise, the Syrian provinces would have actually had trade deficits with Europe. But in fact, it was Palestinian citrus products and Palestinian cotton that led to this 
the Syrian Ottoman um, economy to, to be very, very prosperous during this time. The other thing that's really interesting about this article, apart from countering this narrative of a Palestinian economic backwater, is that it really helps us to think about capitalism and the market in, a, if you will, a pre-colonial pre -colonialist time. So, I mean, then it's a question of what is colonialism? Because this is what a lot of historians would say, it's informal colonialism. You don't have armies on the ground, but you do have European consumption patterns determining what Palestinian farmers are growing. But it is, I think, a very interesting counterpoint and alternative history to what might have happened, you know, prior to Zionism, prior to British colonialism. And it, you know, it, it, it's a very balanced piece in that it doesn't say, you know, capitalism is bad or capitalism is good. It really illustrates that capitalism inherently leads to divisive outcomes. There are the haves and the have nots. There are a lot of Palestinians, or at least residents of Palestine, who did very well during this period because of the sort of incessant European demand for Palestinian goods. And there are a lot of people who did very badly, particularly those, the farmers who, who couldn't grow those products that were demanded in Europe. And what he shows is that Palestinian economy before this period of time, before what he calls a European penetration into Palestinian markets was quite sheltered from global cycles of boom and bust, right? Whatever happened with the Palestinian agricultural markets, if we can even think of something like that in this period, it happened because of local fluctuations in weather, in demand, and supply. What happens in this period that he writes about is that it's changing demand in Europe that determines whether somebody becomes you know, very, very prosperous or whether somebody is destroyed. And so he has this really interesting sub-segment on Palestinian cotton and how it boomed during the American Civil War, because during the American Civil War, American cotton stopped being shipped to European markets. And so European demand for cotton led to you know, producers sort of looking to Palestine and to other places. And this led to a cotton boom. But then once the American Civil War was over and the American producers started you know, selling cotton again to European markets, that was it. The Palestinian cotton was no longer demanded. And that led to a crash in Palestinian cotton markets. And I think in a very short piece, he manages to highlight this is the danger of opening up your economy to the world. And I think it's something that we still have to grapple with when we look at Palestine today, if, if there is ever to be a Palestinian economy, which um, who knows if there will be, but it is a question that I think that comes to the forefront, which is open or shut, sheltered or, or not. And I think that is one of the huge contributions of this piece alongside the fact that it counters this narrative of backwardness. The second piece, Peter Lagerquist, it's very, very different. So Schorsch's piece was published in 1981 and Lagerquist's piece was published in 19, um, in, no, it was in, two, in, in the 2000s. I think I counted, it was exactly a 25 year gap between the two pieces. And that was also deliberate. Lagerquist's piece, he's a journalist, or he was a journalist when he was writing. I believe he's a student now, he's an academic now, but the piece is written as I said, to me, it really reflects the breadth and the different audiences of this journal. It is a piece that looks at, it's really, really fascinating. It's, it's a piece that looks at this French hotel kind of institution called the Club Med, which set up shop in, uh, on the Israeli coast. So what links the two pieces is also the location because Shorish's piece, piece looks at the trading uh, you know, the port cities of Palestine in the 1860s through the 1880s. So it's Akka, Yaffa, and Haifa, which feature very prominently in his story. And Lala Quisbees takes place in the same coast, but in the period of the 1960s, so 20 years after the Israeli occupation. And I think both highlight the centrality of the sea and the coast to capitalism and the story of capitalism in Palestine. And the story of the coast and the Lago Coast piece is really quite simply, there's a hotel, it's a tourist entity, it's a private institution, which leases its land from the Israeli state. The Israeli state does not own this land. This is land that the Israeli state has captured in 1948. And in fact, it is the land of a destroyed Palestinian village called Azib. And this land becomes 
the place for this very, very, very elite hotel, European resort called Ravnet. So in both cases, you have this idea of, okay, you have a private institution here, which is a private French institution catering to, again, in a different way, European consumption patterns. So when in the 1860s, you have Europeans desiring cotton and citrus fruits, what you have here is Europeans, but in fact, it wasn't Europeans, it was elite Israelis who were desiring a different kind of consumption good, which is this kind of a holiday. You go to this elite place. This is, in fact, at that time, the only private beach in Israel, this Club Med thing. That's one of the things that Lagerquist said. And the, the desire among these you know, Israeli consumers to have something like that is, I think, part and parcel of the story of capitalism in Israel after 1948, because consumption patterns in general theories of capitalism are actually devoid of any kind of moral consideration. And one of the things that emerges from Lagerquist's piece is sort of his bafflement that the people who own the hotel, the people who run the hotel, the people who are the customers of this hotel, they have a willful ignorance and a blindness to what, what is this hotel? What is the land it stands on? You know, where does this come from? Why are there these? Because they kept the ruins. This is anybody who's familiar with, you know, how the Israeli capitalist slash tourist economy works. The ruins are very important because it makes it look very beautiful and very old. But the people need to be shunted off. So the people who lived on the land, which would be no surprise to anyone here, have, have been sort of dispossessed and thrown out. And Lagerquist actually manages to interview some of the original Palestinian inhabitants of the land who live at this point in Africa, and they can't even go to this club med. And I think that encapsulates in a very different way. It's a very haunting piece. It's very different from Scholz's piece, but you don't really have personalities. You don't have a human story. And yet you have that same element of here is where rampant, uncontrolled consumption patterns, not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing, but they are devoid of moral considerations. This is where it has intersected with the Palestinian market. And um, I did want, in picking two pieces, I, I did want them to speak to each other. And that's why I also chose them. And um, I guess I'll, I'll end there. Thank you so much, Shumati. Um, before I go any further, I wanna actually myself thank uh, Laura and Bust and Maria Khoury, both of whom worked heroically to put this and other panels together. Uh, we would not have this opportunity, the five of us, uh, to be talking to those 70 something of you, 78 of you who are on uh, this uh, Zoom event and who are also uh, uh, along with us as it's streaming live on Facebook. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I want to highlight two things that I think were, were touched on by well, actually all four of you in different ways. Um, and then I'm going to perhaps let Sadim, if he wants to say a little more about the Fishman piece. Um, let him let him do that. Um, but let me just mention two things that I was really struck, and several of you mentioned this. And these are the links between articles published in the Journal of Palestine Studies and later major works by the same authors. Salim underlined the fact that uh, that um, uh, Bshara Dumani's article uh, is linked to his wonderful book on Jab and Nebris, uh, his very important book. Uh, similarly, uh, Alex. Uh, pointed to the fact that um, that Shush article is a seminal piece on mid 19th century Palestinian economy and political economy and history. And it's linked to his famous book also published by the IPS in English translation on the same topic. And there are many, many others. I mean, Sanim himself has published things in the journal, which later were the kernel of other work he's done. And it's true for many of the rest of us. Um, and I think that's really, really important. You, 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 you can see in the journal things that will later become important in the scholarship in, in their first form as, as journal articles. The other, only other thing I wanted to say um, is that quite frequently the, the, the journal is a, is a venue for under-researched work, um, things that really don't get the attention that they probably deserve. Shimati's uh, discussion of the Lagerkfest, for example. Um, there's not enough work on the, the way in which Israel uh, uh, in, 
is a brand Israel repurposes history uh, and, and sells it as tourism. Um, if you walk through the old city of Jerusalem, you'll hear Israeli tour guides uh, in English or every other language under the sun uh, pumping out a steady stream of lies about history, um, which are very, very important in the selling of Israel. And so I think that that article is an example of, of, of research on one of, of many aspects of this. Um, the other, another I would point to uh, is, the, is the Anderson article on the 36-39 revolt, uh, which, which uh, Alex uh, talked about. Um, there's actually no real book on one of the most important events in Palestinian history. There's no standalone study that I know of, certainly not in English. Um, and that's a gap. And so one of, the, one of the places that articles have been published on this, most notably the Anderson article, uh, is the Journal of Palestine Studies. Um, Salim, I'm gonna just invite you, if you want to say more about the Fishman article, I think you've already talked about it a little bit, but perhaps say something about how that links to what has been going on in the Hadam al-Sharif, uh, not so much under the British mandate or in Ottoman times, the, the article deals with Ottoman times, but since the occupation of 1967, because I think it's, if anybody wants to understand the background and the so-called status quo and where that so-called status quo comes from, you have to go back to Ottoman times. You have to go back to what Fishman deals with in his article. Um, did, could you say just a little bit about that and how it links to present concerns? Well, the essay certainly is a, uh, is a article which is a harbinger, harbinger of things to come about how archaeological excavations have been used to reinforce biblical Zionist claims to the land. And this protest which erupted in 1911 probably was an assertion of nationalism that, that countered the use of archaeology as a legitimation of colonial rule, beginning with the long tradition of the Palestine Exploration Fund in Palestine and its linkages to biblical archeology. span And then of course, the occurrence of time and again with the Burak rebellion in uh, 1929, 21, again in 29, uh, less so in the 36 rebellion, but in all of these cases, you have the focusing of religion and uh, mobilization of religion forces against claims to the land using archeology span as justification. What is interesting about the essay by Fishman is this protest actually turned out with a certain unsaid thing, namely the long tradition of hostility to archaeology in Palestine because they saw archaeology as a source of legitimation of colonial rule, biblical linkages, and Zionist claims. And today we have a very weak archaeological tradition within Palestinian uh, academia and a very strong one in Israeli academia because uh, one was used as a form of nationalist legitimation. The other is used as a protest against it, rather than examining how archaeology can lead us to understand the cumulative cultural history of the Holy Land of Palestine uh, by digging up uh, various layers, including Moabite, Canaanite, Jebusite, Philistine, and so on. So there's a paradoxical uh, consequence of that essay in highlighting not only the question of colonial legitimation and Zionist legitimation, but also a hostility to archaeology that still lurks within uh, Palestinian academia. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi. Um, Leila, do, do you want to say anything more? Um, about any of the any of the the elements of political economy you talked uh, about, I was I was uh, 
I was pleased that you mentioned the use of, I mean, I, I, I love the use of Sayel article that you, that you centered, you know, your article. Um, and I, I think he, like many of these pioneers of that generation, who were both scholars and political activists, he was one of the founding members of the PLO, he was a member of the PLO Executive Committee for many years, um, is not as, as recognized as he should be, any more than is Rosemary Sayel. Uh, some of whose work he bases his work and who is herself probably the preeminent Palestinian sociologist. Did you want to say anything more about that, um, about either Yusuf or, or his, and his work or anything else? In, in, in your... I, yeah, I think, you know, Yusuf's work is very important because it is, it was anchored in a very good understanding of capitalism. You know, it, it's, uh, it was that the old way of studying economics whereby you need to try the structural relationships and the relationship between labor and capital and market. They, they are not separate. The problem is the economic profession, how it became in the 1970s and 80s, especially in the United States, it, it became much more detached from it, its social origins and or social interests. And, and Sayer remains committed to that. The work of Sarah Roy is also committed to that in, in the development, but she, she doesn't have the same critique of capitalism the way that Sayer has it. Uh, because Tasayek was well trained in it as well, and I think what is very beautiful when we see to to Subhi Samour and uh, Adam Haniye and all the new generation, they go back and understand, have a critique of capitalism and an understanding of the economic dynamic of capitalism, but without separating it from its 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 political foundation and and, and the, the, the political economy of it. So I, I think that the journal does a very good job. I mean, I, to do that, there are lots of articles that help us explain what has been the trajectory of Palestinian understanding of the economy, of the Palestinian economy. Does it make sense to talk about the Palestinian economy, you know, as we're moving towards a, 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 a global world in the 21st century that the boundaries between economies are very elusive. Even a, a, to talk about digital economy of, of Gaza when we're talking about an occupation and, and a certain colonial structure that has deepened, you know, we need to find new terms. And what is beautiful about Sayyid's article is that he gives us a word Popularization, you know, which was at the time, it was yet not the fall of the Berlin Wall. So talking about Marxist terminology was bad. No? <laughs> he did not care. He used it. And now you come 20 years later, 30 years later, you're going back to using a critical approach to knowledge building, which I think is very important. And then the other thing I want to say is very important. The journal, it is true, and our emphasis is, has been on labor or a market. Little emphasis in the journal is about capital. And I think in that respect, the work of Shireen Sayali is very important because it brings up the third factor in any capitalist structure or any political economy, capital, the Palestinian capitalists. They were not just all landlord and all peasant and all workers. No, there was businessmen who are very important part of the story. And to talk about it in the pre in, in the mandate area, I think was very important. In the journal, we don't see enough about of the capitalists. We see more in, in, in the, in after uh, the author process because we are busy building the state. So we need the capitalists, we need the, but they become more neoliberal. So I don't know how far we can call them, uh, you know, aboriginal of, of, a, of a progressive or, or of a, a viably sustained economy, but that's not only their fault, is the problem of the structure we are in. We are a neoliberal structure with globally being critiqued, and also a neoliberal economy and a dependent economy, which is internally being critiqued as well, both academically and practically. I think that's what I wanted to say, is that the work at the base where people are trying to challenge, challenge these oppressive economic and, and, and colonial structures is very important. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Leila. I should mention that both Leila and Salim served on the editorial board of the journal for many, many years, and much of the richness uh, of those years uh, is thanks to their efforts to, to solicit articles and in themselves to write. Um, uh, Alex, I'm going to go to you for uh, uh, a reprise, if you want, of anything that you don't think you had a chance to get in. Um, we haven't gotten any questions in the Q&A, so um, uh, I, I, if, if there's anything you want to say, uh, for example, about 3639 and, the, and further about the Anderson article. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, just more generally, I think, again, to reiterate the comments of, of others, the difficulty of choosing two articles um, to discuss when, when looking at this kind of extremely rich back catalog, and also the ways in which, um, you know, Palestinian history and, and, and kind of history as a discipline in general kind of 
melds together with with other kinds of disciplines. And, and you mentioned Rosemary Sayer. And I think, you know, the Journal of Palestine Studies has also been a place where oral history, um, which has been so important um, in kind of writing Palestinian history and, and kind of putting forward Palestinian history has had a, a real kind of strong voice. Um, you know, Rosemary Sayer, but also, um, you know, works like Nathas Nazal, uh, who wrote about the depopulation, de-Arabization of, of the Galilee and kind of really important um, um, articles. Uh, uh, and so I think, you know, I helped edit that article back in the <laughs> 70s when I was a junior, junior, junior graduate student, something at, at IPS. Right, when I tried to make it seem like I had a long involvement with JPS, Rashid was uh, laughing uh, at, at the my uh, my short uh, uh, relationship. No, I, I think, you know, so I, I so I do want to kind of reiterate that and, and the way so much, um, you know, historical works that are anthropological, but kind of historical anthropology or, or other kinds of uh, works that, that kind of draw in um, the kind of history of Palestine into them, even if we might not say that these were written by historians or that they're kind of historical work. But I think it's uh, such a, a kind of rich body of, of work dealing with the Palestinian past, right? Um, and so I think that's that's one, you know, and I think also kind of shifting um, the terms of debate, right? So I think there's ways in which uh, uh, so much, you know, has been written about specific incidents that are kind of crucial to, to um, you know, I'm thinking about the debates about 1948 that went back and forth in, in the pages of, of the Journal of Palestine Studies, um, you know, between people like uh, Noor Masadha and, and, and Benny Morris and, and Avi Shleim and, and others. Um, but I think also kind of not the one thing that the journal has done is it's not been kind of um, limited to the terms of debate set by kind of uh, uh, outsiders or by kind of policy or by, by Israel. Um, Israeli scholarship, and it's really kind of driven by Palestinians who are who are kind of setting different terms of debate and, and kind of looking at, at different, um, looking at Palestinian history as Palestinian history, not just as a kind of reaction um, to events by um, Europeans, by Israelis. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that the Anderson article does so well. And I mentioned that, you know, Rashid, you mentioned that there aren't um, you know, monographs about the revolt. And, and, and there are, I think more recently, we've seen several works that again, focus on the kind of counterinsurgency, the British uh, relationship, um, the British understanding of, of the revolt. Um, people like uh, uh, Matthew Hughes has written a, a recent book, Matthew Kelly, um, even someone like uh, Lale Khalili, I think in, in her work, Time in the Shadows. But, but I think what Charles Anderson's piece does, and I think, generally why I think it's important and why so much of um, what's in the journal is important is that it's really kind of looking at the internal Palestinian dynamics, right? What, how, what were, and it doesn't kind of flatten the, the Palestinian experience, right? It sees the differences between different kind of sectors within Palestinian society, whether it's rural, urban, whether it's kind of professional class elites, um, Alex seems to have frozen. Uh, uh, sabotage, sabotage. No, no. Technical, technical glitches. Um, maybe while he's unfreezing, let us go to you, Srimati, for the last word. Um, please uh, go ahead. And I, there are a few requests uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the chat for. Um, for responses to uh, specific questions. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll address some of those in a minute, but is there anything you want to say? Ah, you're, are you back, Alex? Yes, you are. You froze there for a moment. I'm back. I think I'd, I, I'm not sure where I cut out, but I think I'd kind of made the point, right? That it's really kind of looking at the, the, the nuance, the, the dynamism, the, the kind of rich uh, kind of variation within Palestinian society rather than a kind of flattening right. of Palestinians right. into a kind of single body. So, Shimadi, over to you. I mean, I don't think I, I, I don't want to take the time, the precious little time that we have left to say much. I think the, the only thing I would say is that that archive is very, very rich. And uh, I do hope uh, people who are here on this, on this um, 
Zoom thing, whatever, we'll be able to access it and look through it and dip into it because it is incredibly rich. I learned a lot just even from reading the title. So Maya sent us all titles and that was, I mean, tremendously helpful. And just reading that for me was a learning process, not just about the history, but the historiography and what have been the questions that have been you know, common preoccupations, what are the silences? And, you know, the one thing I did notice just from our panel is nobody really spoke about the mandate period, which is interesting because sometimes I think that is over, you know, studied, but I suppose maybe just not in today's, um, our choices, our, the four of us, our choices. But my main thing to say is that this is such a rich archive and it is such a treasure and I just hope people can access it, students and non-students alike. Um, and I'm happy 